I need something to drink. How many drinks do you have on your desk? There's there's one behind you. You just grabbed two more. I, there was like a coffee earlier. Like, is, is your whole desk just being taken over by liquids? No. The, okay. So the water bottle that is directly behind me is from my flight and is almost empty. The, uh, this is an empty bottle. Okay. Which you the, got out of this... the fridge? You just got that out of the fridge. Yes, yeah, so I got it out of the fridge because I have extras. Okay. This okay. Is... Yes. That's what you got out of the fridge. That is cloudy lemonade. Yes, it's very good. And then this is a cup of water because this is small and will not last me very long. Okay. As professional podcasters, we need to make sure that we spend an hour being as hydrated as possible. That's how it works. You ever go yeah, to like. Yeah, you gotta coat your throat, you know? <laughs> uh, th- 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 this makes our money. Um, hi. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Happy New it's Year, been, Merry Christmas, uh, Happy Holidays. It's been over two weeks since uh, we we last did an episode. And you're... Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm in Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> you're not in the same spot anymore. You're you're very much rip-roaring and ready to get back to the DPC in, on the other side of the Atlantic. And I am still in my sister's bedroom, but that's okay. We all have our places, Joey. Yours just happens to be at your parents' house. I, you know, I had a very lovely Christmas with only my parents because Christmas was canceled because everybody ah. who is not my immediate family got COVID. Oh, no. Wait, dude, you didn't get COVID. I have. Okay. So the, the jury is still out on if I got COVID oh. or not. Um, yeah. If I did get COVID, it was incredibly mild. But I. So. Uh, r- right before break happens, right before right before a little break happens, I go to a party, uh, like 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 a work party, uh, mm-hmm. for for the end of the year. Ah, uh, Joey. So uh, honestly, Joey, look at this guy going out partying every weekend. It's so disrespectful. I don't, honestly, I, <laughs> I, I I I I decided to go out and and see some coworkers, which was probably a bad idea because it was one week too many into the Omicron situation, which I'm sure I don't have to tell everybody is kind of bad. <laughs> Million mm-hmm. cases in the yeah. U.S. today. Million cases in the U.S. today. Positive test. What's up? Um, new record. New high score, baby. Um, wow. I know it's it's actually wild. Uh, so so went to a bar. Um, got. Uh, a little sick after the bar like I like I had like a like a runny nose and just um, like like some congestion in my head and thought that I had a little bit of a cold but to be extra safe I went to go take a COVID test like a PCR COVID test it came back Mm -hmm. negative my my boss who was also at the party and we were also immediately talking to each other face to face without masks on also didn't feel well took a PCR test the same day I did negative Two days later, he had an at-home test that was positive and another PCR test, which was positive. I was only tested once and was negative, but we had the same symptoms of just being congested with runny noses and like not feeling like 100%. Um, so, and, and he did have COVID. He took two PCR tests that came back positive uh, and we had the same symptoms. So maybe? I did, but I I don't know for sure. Yeah, that's kind of weird because uh, so I also uh, ended up getting sick <laughs> for Christmas. Um, Ellie got sick first, and she ended up getting um, some sort of sinus deal, mm-hmm. and uh, she took a PCR test and two rapid tests, and all of them were negative. Uh, and her symptoms were also, uh, like she had like very, very much a a sinus thing going Mm on. Um, it it really seemed like a head cold or a sinus infection, um, which she does get sinus infections. Uh, and then I later got sick and then I like, it definitely felt like a head cold to me. I mean, it it was very different than COVID. Very, very different (laughs) from COVID. So, uh, I don't think we had COVID because like, 
it, I, I don't know. That just seems incredibly rare, right? The, the fact that I had COVID two months ago, uh, that I got boosted, uh, like, you know, not, not long before that. Uh, and also the fact that Ellie's tests, three of them were negative. Uh, I feel like that was very likely just a cold. So it's possible you got the same cold that we had. But. Yeah, because I, I was talking to you and Ellie when you didn't feel well, and we're all like, hey, we all have the same symptoms. Like, that's yeah. weird. We probably got, like, the same Los Angeles head cold that must be going around, right? But but my, my boss had two positive COVID tests, and I'm like... Mm. Mm maybe you had a cold and also COVID like, and I didn't like, I, 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 I'm trepidatious to say that I was sick. I think that there's probably like a 10% chance I had COVID, but what was actually real was, um, my uncle got COVID, uh, which is, he's been sick for over two weeks and hasn't gone to the hospital. His wife, his wife, his son, um, my grandparents, we don't think got COVID, but did have to quarantine and also um, feel sick today, which I'm super worried and anxious about because they're not vaccinated. So basically, my entire family got COVID and Christmas turned into uh, a very quaint day with with my parents and sister, which was nice. But but all all of the plans were, were hard kiboshed and um what is now becoming problematic is that the rest of my family who has been ill is trying to plan makeup Christmas. Like, like that was the goal. We were like, Hey, let's, Ooh. let's just take Christmas and push it back two, three, four weeks, whatever we need. Like we can still have dinner together and celebrate and pretend and listen to Christmas music and play games and whatnot. Right. Like, let's just put the food in the freezer. Um, but my, my, my extended family who like, isn't super hip or strict to COVID protocol is, is now attempting to expedite the having the Christmas thing. Um, they want to do it this weekend. Um, and they still have symptoms today. (laughs) And I'm like, I, I got into a kind of like a fight with them yesterday about like, Hey, I'm not, coming over if you guys still don't feel well like i i like i want you to have a negative test first and then everyone got mad at me the testing isn't real and blah blah blah, blah. um <laughs> so so i i've spent the last like 48 hours like in a fight with my family over covid who currently have covid and it's genuinely a disaster and i'm super not stoked about it um so that was my Christmas break. <laughs> Everyone was sick. I played a lot of video games, and uh, I I played a, I played a lot of video. I watched a lot of movies, and I played a lot of video games, which was nice, but like very quaint. Mm. My Christmas was also pretty low key. Uh, I was at my mom's when I got sick, which was super unfortunate because I was just like, oh, geez. So. Uh, that was a little bit worrisome, but again, really seemed like a cold. Um, and um, yeah, the um, I didn't get to see any of my family, particularly my grandma was uh, the reason that the whole reason that we went up for Christmas in the first place is uh, just because it would probably be one of the last times I would see her. So that in particular sucked that I, I couldn't actually see her. But, um, you know, it is what it is. Better to be safe than sorry. So, yeah, didn't didn't really uh, didn't really see see anybody. Came uh, came back, and I've just been uh, I just chilled That's... because I was soon gonna fly to Sweden. I flew to Sweden on the second of January, so we didn't do anything for New Year's Eve. Ellie and I just uh, hung out at the house together. We watched Matrix, which was real meh. Honestly, that was. <laughs> question about matrix i haven't seen it but i've been on like a. have yeah. t- been on also sorry you didn't get to your grammar that's genuinely a bummer um uh real real tear about like the the idea of of um post-modern movies i'd like watched deadpool and was like thinking about other stuff like that and i heard that there's a whole okay. section in the matrix um that's really polarizing to people because they're basically acknowledging that 
if they don't reboot the Matrix, someone else is going to make it and make it worse. And it's like a thing yes. that they discuss in the movie. How yes. how is how is that as like a chunk of time that was spent on the film for you? Is, is that something to you that's like this is annoying or like oh this is kind of cool how meta and self aware? Like how, how do you feel about that? Um. So the veil they put over that was was very like I'm gonna give you some incredibly light spoilers. They have that conversation, um, in the movie basically about um the 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 Matrix as a video game that is sold around the world mm-hmm. uh, as this trilogy uh, in a video game, and the game creator finds out that uh, that they have to reboot it. Because uh, basically, Warner Brothers is gonna go w- go ahead with or without them, and it, there's this. I th- I thought it was slightly funny, cause just because it was so in your face, mm-hmm. it, you know. Like they have this conversation. It's like you know, this is gonna happen with or without you. What I thought contracts, you know, like I thought contracts protected us against that. And, well, it turns out that's not the case. Uh, so I, I thought that was very funny. Mm-hmm. Um, but as a whole, for the movie. I kind of, and just the kind of the movie in general, I just wish they skipped past all of the bullshit that surrounds Matrix uh, and just <laughs> went into shooty, shooty, bang, bang, you know, fun. Slow mo uh, bullet because, time, like. Because I, I, honestly, like, is there anybody out there who really likes the, the sequel and, and the trequel? <laughs> What's the word for the third in a series? It's the trequel. That's no one fact checked that. That's, that's the word for it. It's the, it's the trequel. No way. It's the sequel. Uh, sequel. Yeah. So does anybody care about those movies? I've I don't never think so. seen two and three, but I have gone back and watched one. So so like I'm y- you. You've never seen two or three, Mister Completionist. Yeah, but I mean, I also don't watch a lot of movies, which is why it was, like, absurd that I actually watched, like, ten or something over Christmas break over the last week. Okay. Like, that that's more than I've watched in one chunk of time in, in like, a very, very long time. Uh, Yeah, so pretty much, like, the second and third, like, anything that's outside of the Matrix itself is, um, I did not enjoy. Let's put it that way. Okay. And I feel like that's a general agreement across people. So the, the part of the reason... Uh, that the Matrix isn't held as a tri- as a as a trilogy uh, to the same regard of like uh, other big trilogies like Lord of the Rings or something is is just the all the the bullshit surrounding the Matrix is just kind of whatever. Um, a lot of people don't like it, including myself. So uh, I I felt like uh, that there was a lot of bullshit surrounding the Matrix when really I just wanted them to be in the Matrix doing cool stuff most of the time. Um, and maybe that makes me a big dumb dumb who only like big shooty and explosions. But uh, to be honest, that's what Matrix did best. That was the best part of the Matrix. Uh, speaking of movies that have a lot of bullshit around them, um, did you watch Don't Look Up? I did. I uh, I enjoyed it. Don't Look Up was um, that's another like meta interesting one. That, that's a that's a movie that is so obviously. Uh, making a statement that it just kind of slaps you over the head with it repeatedly. Um, but I actually did enjoy that movie. In particular, I enjoyed the way the movie ended, uh, which I will not spoil, but I, I felt like there was... If they ended that movie any other way, it would just be wrong, I think. Yeah, I mean, it would so. be wrong to the point they're making also. But um, yeah. I, I, I feel like I wanted to watch that just because of all the people who were complaining about it for and against it, like on social media. Mm-hmm. And I'm, and generally, I know that this isn't a hot take. Um, and it, and it's act, like this is, I don't like having basic opinions. I like to think of myself as someone who doesn't have basic opinions. I really mm-hmm. like Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> like like oh, yeah. a, who like a, like a lot. Like I, he's he's one of the very few actors where I'll be like, I'll watch that because I like Leo. Um, if I was a, a blonde woman, uh, a, a beautiful blonde woman under the age of 25, I would be super interested in dating Leo, you know? I mean, 24 might be too old, if we're being honest, but, you know, <laughs> w- what have you. Um, have you seen that chart? It's eerie. It, I it's don't like eerie. it. I don't it's like, like he it. Has a cut, he has a cutoff date at, like, I think it's 25. Yeah. I, he has a cutoff date. It's so fucking weird. 
like I, I kind of like I get it. I guess in some way, if you're not a person built for a relationship, like uh, like marriage and that sort of thing, and and you're an actor and like you just you know love young beautiful women, like okay, but at some point in time, it starts getting like weird. Yeah, he, and kind of creepy. Like ten years, if this is still happening ten years down, it's now creepo zone. You know, no matter how good that you're looking. Exactly. Um. So. I I also liked Don't Look Up. Obviously, I think that we both fall in the demographic of people who like understand the message. I think it's interesting because it's not really meant for us and it's not really meant for people who are the polar opposite of us, but it's for people who are generally apathetic and don't think about these things much, like my mom yeah. or people who like don't vote. And I'm really interested to see how those people uh if if there was uh, some brain cells rubbing together in those people, um, I will say they probably thought it too preachy. That's what I'm gonna guess. I'm yeah, gonna guess they thought it was too preachy. If they understand it, I cannot wait for like my. Can you not? How can you not? Honestly, I, I, I feel like that message is really obvious. I think you're giving people too much credit. I will report back after a couple of people who I don't think will really read the tea leaves, watch the movie, like my mom, which is okay. not a slight at her, but she like you know, there's people who don't like analyze. They're or, apolitical. Or, not, not, not just yeah. that, but I, but I also think there is a large group of people who don't like watch movies and think about like what is the message, what is the motif, what is they saying. Like I, I think yeah, that yeah. you know that's 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 something different. I laughed. I feel more. like apolitical is a good word for that, right? Because if you're asexual, you just don't think about sex. You just it's not a thing. Well, well, you know? What I'm saying is is I'm I yes I think you're correct in that apolitical is like is like a different group of people who this should be targeting. But also I'm saying that there's a lot of people who don't do like analysis on movies and think about it more than the surface mm. level of what they're watching. There are people okay. who will watch that movie and not relate the comet to anything else. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I feel like there's no analysis needed. It's just <laughs> there. It's just there in a flashing neon light. That might be, you might have more uh, faith in humanity than I do that. <laughs> um, I laughed. Yeah. I laughed more at, like genuinely laughed more at Jennifer Lawrence in that movie than I did watching the entirety of Deadpool. Mm. Um, yeah, I think the, the, I, I found the money, uh, the movie pretty funny. I thought that the acting uh, was pretty good as well. I think Jennifer Lawrence and Leonardo DiCaprio are pretty good actors. So, Yeah, and Kate Blanchett too, and Timmy Stalich. It, it, it was good. Um, you know what I watched, though, that I don't know if you know about, that I don't know if a lot of people know about? Um, it, it's like a little more art housey. Is, is I watched a movie called Mass, um, which I think is best experienced if you don't like read too much into what the movie's about so if you like film and particularly you like uh, uh actor performances you should just add mass m-a-s-s to your to your 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 letterbox or backlog or whatever and then just uh just watch it and tell me if you liked it um yeah. it, it's that uh, character performance that looks like a plain movie to me and it's, unfortunately, uh, I, I had to look it up just purely. So now I know what it looks like, the the cover art of the mm -hmm, movie. Mm -hmm. So when I see it on a plane, I'll actually watch it. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's what I did on the, this flight is that I watched, I think, three movies. I think two of them were scary movies. Oh, art house movie. I watched The Lighthouse. Did you watch that? I didn't watch The Lighthouse. No. Did you like it? I did um it was it was a uh, a bit trippy um is, is it and... eerie and creepy or is it like like how much like like horror scary does it get i to? think i think if you've seen the trailer they tr they play off the creepiness uh more uh but then again they went farther in some ways with the the um supernatural part than than i expected mm -hmm. in some ways uh, but as a whole, I enjoyed the movie, uh, and it's mostly due to the performances of the actors. I mean, Willem Dafoe is, is I will, I'll watch any movie that has him act, you know, because he, he does a fantastic job acting, but he's also really fun to watch as an actor. Like, he's got this nice mix of, like, Nicolas Cage 
and a real actor, you know, where he just kind of like is able to meet them in the middle where you're like, I am here to see the spectacle that is Willem Dafoe. But I also think he's like legitimately great as an actor. And uh, Nicolas Cage is like <laughs> has his moments, his great moments for sure. But like Willem Dafoe, I feel like I respect him more as an actor. So that's why you watched Aquaman, because you're like, man, I got to see William Dafoe. <laughs> I didn't even know he was in that, to be honest. They should have played him more in the trailer. <laughs> uh, yeah, Maybe they, I would have watched. They would have got your movie ticket. Of, um, you should. Yeah, you should. You should uh, whatever the fuck. Yeah, you should. You should watch Pig if if you're uh, kind of into the whole uh, into the whole. Um, who the fuck did you just say? Um, Will and Duffo? No, Jesus, the other person. Holy, I'm having a senior moment. This is embarrassing. Um, uh, Oh, oh my. I, are you talking about the other guy that's in that? Because I didn't, I don't remember his name, but it's the guy from Twilight. Nicholas Cage, Jesus Christ! Oh, um, Nicholas Cage. You, you, you oh, mentioned okay. Nicholas Cage and like him as a character actor. You should, you should probably watch Pig. Um, okay. Anywho, you uh, so to, to continue on this train, um, uh, l- less on movies, but I uh, saw that on 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 your Steam wish list you had Cultist Simulator and I and I was feeling yeah. and I was feeling very much uh, like like Santa at at two a.m. on Christmas and g- honestly spent too much money on gifts for people uh, but that's that's okay you know what it was a great year it was a great year and so- I <laughs> I. I'm I'm familiar with Cultist Simulator as a game and a concept, uh-huh. but as soon as I saw people play it, I think that I realized I was going to be too stupid to actually uh, play the game or get uh-huh. invested in it. But I had an inkling that your brain is big enough to, <laughs> to sit down and wow. play it. Wow! <laughs> Thank you, Joey. It it was a. That, the real present wasn't the game. It was the compliment that came with it. Wow. You know what's funny is I specifically didn't thank you because I was like, I want to thank Joey on the podcast for giving me this Christmas present and we'll also talk about it. So I specifically didn't thank you and then I just forgot about it because it's been so long at this point in time. Did, was, yes, Joey, was, was Joey sent me Cultist Simulator um, and that is a fucking art house game for sure. Uh, because the game just kind of like throws you uh, into it in a way that a roguelike, uh, like a lot of roguelikes do this because you're expected to like lose and, and die in your first round and stuff like that. Uh, but this does it on like a very different level where most roguelikes, there's like a basic understanding automatically of what to do and how to win, get stronger. <laughs> you know find things to to level you up or whatever and and kill bad guys um and this does not do that because the premise of cultist simulator is that uh initially that you are a person uh you are just a regular person and your goal is to kind of survive um while achieving enlightenment Okay. Okay. That's kind of your that that is the basic premise of your goal initially, um, and that is discovered through the cards that you're given bit by bit. Basically, you have like you have like a work tab, and you constantly need to be putting in the work tab. You just got to make sure you're working, otherwise you run out of funds, and you you have to use one money every single day. And if you run out of funds, and you start starving, and if you start starving, things start bad things start happening to you. You get bad cards. Um, and, and then there's a thought tab and there's a, a study tab and there, and, and it slowly gives you like more and more of these pieces and the cards they give you are like, you, uh, you'll get an idea tab, like a concept, like a concept of this enlightenment. Mm-hmm. And it comes with like a bunch of lore, like words to it. And you actually have to w- read the, the card lore. To kind of understand because the what do you, what can you do with an idea? You can sleep on it, right? That's another tab. You can sleep on it. So, for example, in the sleep tab, if I put money into the tab, it's basically guaranteeing I have good dreams because I'm purchasing opium and I'm going to sleep with opium. Or I can sleep on an, on an idea, and that idea will 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 uh, turn into. Uh, potential other like dreams or something stuff like that like concepts uh, uh, metaphysical concepts that it'll turn into uh, you can uh, what what else can you but you can also like study concepts 
you can you can uh like you, you can uh explore there's an exploration tab so sometimes you you get uh like certain things that that are given to you so like that's basic that is kind of the the weird parts of the game the other part of the game is like and part of your achieving enlightenment is that you're building up a cult okay. you're building up a cult so you're you're trying to like push the um the ideas of of uh what the basic ideology of the cult is you're trying to discover that while also in the process of bringing people in to your cult and the whole entire time there is a uh what is called the suppression bureau so it's very uh 1988 you know like it, it's very much that right where it's like uh, hey, the the government's trying to limit your thought and it's trying to shut down you as a cult. And so it's uh, it, yeah, it was it was interesting. It got a little frustrating at some point in time, and I haven't beaten it yet. So the the whole it, so does it operate on runs like like you do runs of it when you get suppressed and you have to start over again? Yeah, and then uh, that actually makes it more interesting because uh, you get a different um. You get different. Sorry, 1984. I was like 1988. That I wasn't funny. gonna correct you. But... <laughs> the uh, it, so then you get to play as different people. So I started off as just like a common laborer, uh, and then I failed that run. Uh, actually, no, I didn't fail that run. I ended that run. The game ended my my run by telling me that I didn't achieve enlightenment, but I did live like a decent life, and. That should kind of be considered success. It said something like that. It was just like, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you lived a life. And that's, it's not failure. That's good. You didn't die of starvation or anything. You lived a, a, a an unexplored, mediocre life. Even you <laughs> explaining the game to me, e even you explaining the game to me feels dense. And I feel like people mm. who've been listening are probably like, I don't know if i get all of it and because i don't know if i get all of it which is if you like if you if you're if you're at a computer just like google cultist simulator and just look at the way the game looks it's just a tabletop with a fuck ton of cards on it like it is yeah. it, it, it looks and clearly is dense and i'm glad i'm glad that you were able to make a little bit of sense out of it <laughs> I, I i did enjoy it but i will say like i think the gameplay aspect so for example the work tab you always you need to be working and what happens you put it into a thing 60 second goes by it shoots your card back out and then you have to put it back in and you have to keep doing that all the time and part of that repetition is like it's very much um you know like spitting dishes like you know they, they're just trying to yeah. like get a bunch of things going on but i also think the repetition is also playing into the meaning of the game um ah. But it, it makes the gameplay bad, I think, in, in some degrees. Like, I, I wish some of those things, they would just, like, I, I just can't imagine, like, why didn't anybody, I, I feel like if I sat down and played that game, I'd be like, you guys have a great concept here, I really enjoyed it, but at a certain point in the time, I'm no longer having fun. I'm just trying to explore the game and trying to beat it, but I'm not having fun doing it anymore because you're making me do these things constantly. Um, so... I, I did enjoy it, and it's super interesting, and, I, and I'm going to go back and beat it for sure. Uh, I, I will just say one more thing. The third life that you play... So I, I lived... I, I, I lived... I eventually uh, like got, got that first ending on my, very, on my first run. The second run, I, I fuck up and I die of starvation. Because I wasn't paying attention. Or no, I sorry. I, I died of depression, not starvation. So uh, on the, my third run... You start the third run, you're playing as an officer in the suppression bureau, and you're trying to shut down people like you were just playing. You were trying to to shut down people who are being a cultist. So now you play as a suppression officer where you're every day, you're going to work, and you understand as a result why that dickhead is constantly harassing you and trying to investigate you because then you play as a suppression officer and you find out that you get more money. By hunting down these people. And also the suppression officer is also trying to start his own cult. But like, you know, that's that's a different thing. But I thought it was funny. I was just like, oh, I get why this guy was constantly trying to study me. Because he gets more money when he does it. 
when he gets evidence on me, he gets more money as a result. And like those incentives are what drive him. Uh, and I, I thought I, I thought that that little bit was like very, very interesting. I, I very much enjoyed that little turn. So one of the reasons why, and something that I think you touched on, um, why why ga- why a game like Cultist Simulator got on my list, and something that I think that I'm interested in in game design is like the idea of of mechanics as metaphors, where you're actually uh, experiencing like what the character's experiencing. Mm. Uh, like you know, yeah. Cultist Simulator, it sounds like um, you know you're kind of experiencing what your characters go through, right? By like some of the menial tasks, which may not be fun, but like it's the work you're doing, right? Um, or, or like the, the role swapping you're doing or another, like, um, I think people talk, I know people talk about like dark souls a lot as having, you know, their difficulty is kind of a metaphor for the, uh, oppression that the character is actually feeling in the game. And like, it's built around Mm -hmm. the idea that, uh, you know, of, of, of what it is or, um. The, the 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 choice to harvest or save little sisters in Bioshock, mm. um, you mm-hmm. know s- stuff like that, or um, um, uh, yeah, I'm I'm blanking, but like like a lot a lot of games have stuff like this, and I think I think it's really interesting when like through the gameplay you're doing, you're kind of feeling some of the same emotions that in theory your character's supposed to be feeling. Um, whether it be like, you know, oppression or menial labor. Um, and I think that that is, is like a cool, probably underutilized, but really special uh, element of games as a medium that you just simply can't mm-hmm. get out of, you know, books, movies, what have you. Um, and I don't have a way to transition off of that point. I, I also I also <laughs> enjoy that. And, and I think that um, I think in some ways it's an underrated uh, concept of games because I think people it's like you in order to enjoy that aspect you maybe have to think about it a little bit but I think it's so much harder to come up with that concept to understand what they're doing putting forward to you is like one thing but to be able to come up with that as as a concept uh for your gameplay um and the the meeting you're trying to put forward behind it I think is is uh very I don't know it's very five head very very smart i think it's uh interesting that people are able to come up with stuff like that so yeah All right no i agree with you that's uh, been the pow- the game review power hour with the uh, <laughs> cap and joey um dude i played so much stuff i i i, I played resident evil. i played like a bunch of resident evil games and a bunch of other things i had a, had a pretty had a pretty meaty break um, how many games how many games did you finish up over the year if if, if you stall for a second i will pull it up okay yeah, Joey had put out this list on uh, on Twitter, and uh, it, it's very impressive. But now, now and like, sad, it, and sad. Please, please it, acknowledge that it's sad. <laughs> well, it makes more sense. Well, yeah, I, honestly, it's um, I uh, another person that I enjoy and have respect for is uh, Phil Phil Aram, who used to be the uh. Uh, used to be the manager of Evil Geniuses, who uh, now leads back. the the LCS player organization. Yeah, and and he does a thing uh, where he does a similar thing of consuming uh, movies. That's his thing. Is mm-hmm. he consume movies? So it does make sense to me. Uh, it makes more sense to me that you said you don't watch a lot of movies because instead your thing is games. So the, um, I I rolled credits. Uh, or finished i finished 80 games um and that that spans like things that are really short like 40 minute art house games to like playing all of you know near automata and and uh link to the past and long games too right so so very that that number is you know odd i don't i don't know if you averaged it like for for general game time but it's a lot i'm trying to think what game you said the Automata one, Near? And, and then it clicked to me. I was like, oh, that's that one that people really s- fucking sexualize. Oh, yeah. Is, uh, is, is, it, is it as sexualized in the game as... All I see is people all the time, like, that's what they cosplay as all the time. It's the... If you guys don't want to talk about it, it's the... You, know, you will have seen this, I'm sure, somewhere. It's the girl with, like... They're both, like, have, like, a leather mask over their eyes or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And they're, they're wearing very uh, tight clothes it's a guy and a girl it's it's very i i see it all the time 
a lot a lot of people really like Nier, and it's also it's a good game. But like you know, a, okay. a lot of people really like like cosplaying as Nier. So uh, so yeah, so I I finished eighty games uh, over the course of the year, and I played more than that because I definitely didn't finish all of them. Right? Um, yeah. And I, I don't know how many I played, but but I rolled credits on on eighty and forty six of them, almost fifty two. My goal was to get to fifty two, but I just it just didn't get there. Was games that were released this year. Um, so, wow. so that's, that's a lot. And if you're talking about like, you know, over the break, <laughs> what, what I was doing, like w- in, in between us recording podcast episodes, I beat, uh, quadrilateral cowboy, resident evil Two remake psychonauts Two, resident evil village, not for broadcast bloodstained rituals of the night, Tom Cancy splitter cell conviction co-op and legend of Zelda Minish cap, which is eight. Which is it, it's a, that's a lot of time. <laughs> what what was the worst game that you finished? Uh, uh, Tsunami and I like to play a lot of co-op games together, and we played okay. the co-op for Splinter Cell Conviction because the co-op for uh for uh Chaos Theory is so good. Um, and people told us that Conviction also had like similar good co-op, and it was garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now you know not to trust that person's opinion ever again. It's true. Um, out, out of the other games, they're all like games that are worth playing. My least favorite was probably Psychonauts Two, but that's like coming up against other games that are still like you know big things. I'm happy someone forced me to play Resident Evil Village because I'm Resident Evil is like not one of my favorite game franchises. I don't really like horror, and I never really liked the older RE games. But I played RE2 remake, and then right after that played Village, and I'm very happy that someone like forced me to do that because I ended up having a lot of fun doing it. Mm-hmm. Okay, you you enjoyed that big big lady vampire. Honestly, people are right. She's pretty hot. Yeah, it's pretty pretty yeah. hot. Pretty <laughs> hot. Um, it's the year of the big lady. <laughs> Dawn uh, Breaker, Lady Demestra <laughs> they, They're everywhere. D- Damocles. I don't even remember. Um. That's the real end of the gaming power hour. If you want to talk about games with me, I'm happy to do so in the side poll discord, which is, you know, uh, linked in the, in the somewhere. Um, I will happily talk about any of the games on my list. And uh, if, if you look on Twitter, I, I linked the full list of games I played and it's uh, something that I think I like, I, I, I completed a lot of my backlog over the last year and a half, like probably like 18 months. And there's not a lot of games left that I want to play that aren't, you know, future coming out things, which I feel like is great because I feel like I've accomplished something. Um, But also, I think that uh, I really want to um, this year find an outlet somehow to to talk about games more. Um, because I think that it's not something that we get like, like we do it on the show sometimes, but I, I would like to kind of sharpen that blade of myself more. Cause I think that I have some of the expertise and the experience from playing and the experience from like, you know, talking and, and writing to maybe not necessarily just straight up do reviews. Like that feels basic or not even do funny reviews because that takes a fuck ton of time that I don't have, but just, um, an, an outlet to bring, um, more general non-gaming, uh, non-competitive gaming into the Team Liquid sphere as we look to, you know, 2022 projects. Because um, mm-hmm. uh, I'm assuming that, you know, people who like esports generally like games, and then there's definitely a Venn diagram of people who like competitive games, Dota, League of Legends, Counter-Strike, what have you, and people who like, you know, either art house indie games or triple a games or single player experiences like there, there's definitely a lot of venn diagram overlap there or at least some um so so i i want to figure out how i could take you know what what is uh probably one of the things that i'm have the most expertise on and and mm-hmm. you know do more with it that that that's a goal of mine this year yeah it's a good idea You're, you'd be a great person to head something up like that so yeah, I think you're, you're definitely on the right track to make some sort of content out of something like that. Or just give me an outlet to talk more because I'm a big narcissist. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, Dota. Eh. <laughs> eh. Listen, we had, uh, okay, this is your Dota update. Nothing's happened. 
We had Christmas. It's been a Christmas break. There was no uh, good drama that happened in the last two weeks in Dota specifically. Uh, we'll probably talk about the big drama that happened, esports drama. But Dota specifically, not much has happened. The DPC has just started back up. That's why I'm back in Sweden. Uh, the Chinese DPC uh, Division One kicked off a, a, a little bit earlier than the other regions, so that's currently going on. Very exciting stuff. Did you it was see... just a hype game three between IG and RNG. Dude, yeah. I, I, I'm assuming this clip is on Reddit, but someone personally shared it with me. Fucking. Uh... Uh, RNG Som- Somis uh, <laughs> going from three health to uh, four health yeah. to uh, rampage on Lena. Yeah. Ooh, it was, it was it was also JT's fuck up. The reason that happened too. So no, nobody pointed that out. And people uh, like JT blinked in with uh, Scythe of Ice refresher, and he he blinked in Scythe of Ice to Lena once, ref- and then dropped his ultimate. Uh, and then refreshed and dropped his ultimate again. But the first scythe hit a Lincoln's. So he could have actually stopped that Lena. That that game oh, was no. theirs. They would have won that game. IG should have won that game. But JT did not use his second part of Scythe of Ice, which is the whole reason, like, the, the fact that the Lena is not disabled is what allows them to win that fight because she pops Satanic after going down to four health, as you said, and then she instantly goes up, back up to full health because she's got a Divine Rapier. So he, uh, he he's the one who fucked that up. Not to, not to call anybody out. I think JT's a great player, uh, and uh, I, I think he's fantastic on IG. But you do have to acknowledge the truth of the situation, and uh, I'm sure he receives some some angry words from people. Yeah, I'm sh- so, like even if they didn't necessarily realize that in the moment, they very quickly watched the replay of that fight and then someone went, "Wait a second. <laughs> Did you not use yeah. your second scythe?" And then he went, "Uh, no." <laughs> yeah. Um my you know what my second favorite part of that clip is? Um mm-hmm. Somnus was using a beauty filter on his player webcam. Oh, was he really? I actually didn't notice that. <laughs> if you go if, so if you go back and look at it, he's using like a, like an Instagram like beauty model like, you know, blush face smoothing he, he <laughs> filter, which I thought was really funny. <laughs> that is really funny. Uh only other thing that happened was there was a Christmas tournament that happened in China called the Huya tournament. And the interesting thing that happened there was that it was uh, it involved Southeast Asian and Chinese teams, mm-hmm. and the Chinese teams in that were not bad. Uh, I will give them. Uh, I will. I will say that they probably were not in good shape for that tournament um, because Upper Division hadn't started yet, and they were probably this is probably just a warm up tournament for them. Um, but Ob Neon won that tournament. Um, Obi Neon is the Southeast Asian team. They're currently sitting seventh in the upper division because they've gone zero and three. What? Uh, and are very likely going to get relegated because Southeast Asia is very competitive and they have yet to play T1. So you kind of have to assume their record is zero and four currently. But I've been saying, I, I don't think this Obi Neon team, I, don't, I, I, I hope they stay in upper division because I think they're, they are legitimately a good team. And I think it goes to show the strength of the, uh, the depth, rather, of the Southeast Asian uh, region. The fact that, the, that this team is legitimate, I think. And they're, they've gone zero and three uh, and win a tournament like Kuya. They uh, beat... Again, Chinese teams were probably not really ready and stuff like that, but it's still very impressive that they managed to do that. I think that beating IG, which they did at least once, I know they they beat RNG twice and they also beat IG. Um, yeah, it, beating IG, regardless of their level of practice, knowing that team's like skill ceiling and that team's lineage, is impressive. Like full stop. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, shout out to them for Did, being able to win their tur- their tournament. That that tournament just would have come and gone and wouldn't have been that interesting if it wasn't for the fact that Obi Neon won it. 
Um, I, I'm interested in, in Chinese Dota, even though that one does have the asterisk of, like, people not playing that much. So I'm always interested to see how, like, you know, Vici and Acer and all those people are stacking up against each other. Did, mm -hmm. um, TNC was at that event, right? Did they finally win a game? <laughs> um, TNC won individual games in the group stage. They went one and one, um, with multiple teams. Okay. But uh, I believe in their series... Oh, no, they got eliminated in groups. There was eliminations in groups. So, yeah, they they haven't won a series. So, no. TN, TNC... TNC, there is a difference between OB Neon and TNC for sure. Even though I think they had the same record in Southeast Asia, um, they there there is a difference, and I think this this Huya tournament definitely showed that there is a difference. One team got eliminated in groups. The other team won the whole entire tournament, so... Dude, do you think like Febby is not having a good month or two? <laughs> yeah, I mean that that roster is just again. I I feel like that 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 roster's got like one or two players that I would hold on to. If I was TNC, if I was the organization, and I have the money uh, to pick up other players, I I would only hold on to one or two of the players on TNC and look uh for replacements but they'll get to do that in the lower division because they are definitely heading down there <laughs> <laughs> unless some some miracle happens they get a whole lot better a whole lot quicker you mentioned uh other esports drama that happened over over the little bit of a break what were you referencing i was referencing by now if you guys have followed any uh <laughs> i mean this blew up to a level that like non-esports people um started hearing about this but uh thorin and semler okay so the start of this drama is that esl announced a women's league uh with a prize pool of i think five hundred thousand dollars so pretty sizable commitment wow um that's they put out awesome. a, yeah they put out a video and stuff like that and um Specifically, Thorin and Semler um, had a rather bad reaction to it on social media, and uh, it 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 went real viral real fast. And uh, yeah, it just started a whole discussion about. Um, it, okay, it started a discussion some some places on the internet, but mostly it just turned into people making fun of. Uh, Thorin, Semler, and uh, people who have opinions that are the same as those two. Uh, including an infamous tweet from Thorin, uh, where he does his classic, quote, retweeting someone and talking shit. And he ends the line uh, saying, I am esports. And uh, the internet ran with that, and it became a, a big old meme. I think that anybody who's listened to a lot of episodes of Side Pull will uh, know that I am not generally a giant fan of Thorin. Um, so there's a little bit of, uh, I don't mind dancing on the grave. <laughs> like, when, when, when this is all happening, uh, like, you know, selfishly, and like, this isn't the best look ever, but I'm like, ah, yes. Once again, he just proves to kind of be a piece of shit. Uh, and oh, more people are looking at that. Man, I, I guess I guess you know that that uh, hot take I have is very lukewarm or cold. Um, so like watching everybody clown on him did bring me like an unfortunate mild amount of uh, joy. But also, mm -hmm. I <laughs> you know I, I don't agree with the point he was making. <laughs> even a little bit um <laughs> so so i think that i i think a lot of this lies uh this is this is in general a a uh weird thing because it's a political discussion that ha worms its way into esports um mm -hmm. and the political ideo ideologies uh that separate joey and semler and thorin are are pretty i i would say pretty wide vast pretty massive divide like there. grand canyon <laughs> And I, I, I'm not sure if we want to do this on this podcast because it, it might be a little bit too long. But I figured I was like, I think I'm slightly not. I think we see eye to eye. I think we're very, very close uh, politically speaking. But like, I think I'm maybe slightly centered to you. 
Uh, and, and I thought about, I thought it would be an interesting, a more interesting uh, topic of conversation for this, for me to actually uh, try and play a little bit of devil's advocate, uh, because I don't agree with their point. Uh, but I also think so, something that slightly bothered me about this is that there are a lot of people who who think like Thorn and Semler. And I think that most of what happened in reaction to this uh, did not do those people any favors in pulling them over the line, you know, cool. so, to pulling them more towards. I think it really just shoved them away and was like, look at all these sexist pigs who think that women uh, you know, like whatever, you know, exactly. And I mean, uh, th this probably isn't the proper form to get into it. So I'll try and keep it brief. But like, I think that that's kind of something that we see beyond esports and just in our general life right now is that yeah. the the conversations that we're having are becoming so polarized that you know mm -hmm. if if you agree with thorin there's people on twitter who are going to call you a sexist pig even if you're not a sexist pig or don't feel like one and then you will feel attacked and then you won't listen to anything and then you know yada 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 there's there's no nuanced discussion happening which by and large is nearly impossible to have over twitter in the first place by design but like there, there aren't like Co engaging conversations about um like what is better for women's esports because i think that there is an interesting conversation to be had about what is the best path forward is there mm -hmm. is it a separate but equal thing which is like a phrase that has like a lot of really bad connotation <laughs> especially in america but like that that's that's essentially like what you know professional women's sports is right like the wnba or even like a lot of stuff in the olympics mm -hmm. like it, it is separated and segregated but like equal and that equal is also incredibly loaded because and someone can say like joey what does a wnba player get played versus an nba player can you even call that equal and the answer is no but like and similar to this what does a female counter-strike player make versus a male counter-strike player make can you call that equal mm -hmm. no but um just, just, just for like the the, the 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 sake of argument or like explaining like you know what what is a better system is it to have segregated leagues to build up people is it to not have segregated leagues and wait long enough to eventually have you know uh it, women intermixed with men like we all think is entirely possible and realistic in esports because uh, like i'm of the opinion that there's like there's a reason why the hundred yard dash has a male heat and a female heat Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that given enough time, there is no reason to have a, 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 a difference between male and female competition at the highest level because females should be able to compete with males in esports. Like, yeah. But you can't enable that to happen without fostering that growth and right now because of a bunch of like systemic issues beyond esports whether it be you know gendering games for most of our lives where like games are like a masculine thing and not a feminine thing and girls don't grow up playing games like that's what you especially see like multiple generations like ours compared to kids these days right like you know that plays a factor whether it's you know uh people like that you you, you don't have you know female role models playing you don't have you know a lot of serious like female lineage even though some of it does exist like it's not the same level like you have to i believe uh take resources to foster that scene and grow it and that's what is happening with you know game changers in valorant or esl doing a female counter-strike league and taking it seriously and and i i think is like a phenomenal initiative because it allows people to start to close that gap and i think that's is what we're looking at happening right like we need to close the gap that exists with 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 the the the, the gender bias in our space um and and you, i think most importantly you need a lot of time you need a lot of time and you need a lot more diversity just in base player base when you only have five percent of the dota population as females statistically you're not gonna have a lot of female you know nine ten k mmr players right mm -hmm. or even possible because of the statistics of it but 
when you show them that there is uh, a, an ecosystem that allows them to commit to it full time to to be a job like they're doing in Valorant, then you're you're starting that step. Um, and then after you have that, you know, some some closer equality between genders that you can start to talk about, well, should we have mixed gender tournaments? Should all tournaments be mixed gender? Should we have separate leagues? Like, what what do you? But until we're at that point where it's even possible, I think facilitating a women is important, which is what ESL is doing. And yeah, I, I guess that that's yeah. my stance on it. I agree. I think uh, I think we see eye to eye on that. I think uh, I I will say that I think the um, the response uh, I I talked about how the the response probably pushed people away. That is uh, like the part part of that is similar in Thorin's uh, fault because the what what they did is they didn't put forward like hey here's here's what I think is a, a problem with some of the messaging of this. Here's what I think, you know, uh, I believe is the right way forward uh, to be able to increase equality between men and women. Here's uh, here's the things that I disagree with. Like they didn't put forward like a very serious light similar in particular, did like a, a very trite, like what are we getting only men, you know, t men only tournaments to like increase stuff. Uh, and from what I gather, I think a lot of the stuff that they, they said is just like, uh kind of bs but what i gather is the i think the most legitimate complaint that they that they maybe have is essentially the messaging from the video from esl was that it was kind of like hey women experience a lot of tox toxicity and stuff like that and they kind of said like we're gonna take them out of that environment and 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 take them away from uh Toxicity and the implication being there is you're taking them away from men. Men are toxic and like you're somehow not going to have uh, any toxic environment within a, a female only. We know there's no toxic which... females. They don't exist, right? Like... <laughs> yeah, it, it, it doesn't happen, uh, which I, I guess is like the only point that I can kind of agree with is like, OK, maybe the messaging could have been like a little bit better, but I feel like it's a very, very small thing. Uh, other than that, than that, having like a philosophical belief that like um, like an ideological belief that um, that it, the way forward for equality doesn't start at separation. I can see how there are people who believe that. Um, but as many people have pointed out, that's why we have development leagues in the first place is to like try and grow the scene in various aspects right whether it's trying to raise up the younger players and have college leagues um and try and get people involved who are under the even the, under the age of 18 or who are at college level is a reason why we have like regional tournaments and stuff like that to try and build up um player base and and that sort of thing uh viewership in in specific regions and hey, like we have that everywhere um, I guess another discussion would be potentially the money. Like, is it just too much money, right? Is it like 500,000? Because like, if you just want to do like economics of it, right? Wouldn't it just be something like, uh, is that amount of money being put in like too much to compare to like what the base should be or whatever? I'm like, I don't know. But I found, uh, I personally found the most value out of this conversation, um, out of some of the, uh, the female gamers um, that came out um, and talked about their own stories. And in particular, I think um, Sapphire, if you guys know, she is a CSGO observer. Um, she was one of the only like female players who, who like played um, way back when um, at a high level from what I gather. Mm -hmm. And she uh, is also, I think now, I think her thing says vice president of, of Dignitas. Anyway, she came out saying uh, saying some stuff that I I personally thought was really interesting because uh, I thought it was mostly interesting. The most interesting part about it for me was the fact that she said she did believe those kind of ways that she should just like keep her head down. She didn't like being pointed out as a woman. Uh, you know, she, she's like, I'm a, a CSGO player. Like, I, I, you shouldn't make a big deal out of me being a woman. Uh, and how her thinking has changed since then. Um, she's got some tweets out about her. I would encourage people to uh, to check it out. Um, but basically, she says that, you know, she kind of regrets um, not trying to be more of a role model um, because, you know, having representation and role models is important. And, and, you know, the fact that somebody changes their mindset on that and obviously has a very 
intimate uh, perspective of of what it is like to be a woman in gaming, to uh, you know, like the upsides and, and downsides of like being a representative for other people. Um, I, I thought I enjoyed that the most um, was the various perspectives. I retweeted a couple of them, but hers was probably, I think, the ones that I appreciated the most. So. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think that she had super great takes and like knowing her perspective is, is super stellar too, because there are very few people who fit her bill, uh, of, of, of women who have made it to like a competing at a high level in, in the environment, right? Like you can talk like mm -hmm. v very few people in, in league, like Scarlet and Starcraft, you have, we have hard, a couple Hearthstone players, but like it's, it, it, it is what it is, uh, and I think that the way that you stop just going, oh, it is what it is, is to facilitate things like the ESL tournament. I think it's important to like, yeah. you know, if, if you're if, if you're a woman listening to this as a Dota podcast and like not interested in something like Dota Valkyrie. <laughs> the one woman. That's not <laughs> And our statistics, the one woman. I know that there's more than one. Um <laughs> One, we appreciate you. Two, mm -hmm. uh, like if, if you're not familiar with like Dota Valkyries or like other other people who do, um, you know, uh, grassroots focused work and outreach to create a community and run tournaments and foster growth for minorities, like look look into that. Or if you're someone who wants to support stuff like that and but aren't a female player, like still look into Dota Valkyries. Look into people who are like actually putting in the work to try and create change. Because we can sit here and talk about it all we want, but like there's people who are actively trying to make the spaces more inclusive, and they're the people who are like really the heroes here. Um, yeah, they. Uh, we actually just had a, a female tournament in Dota where some. Uh, it was like a. Fe it was a national tournament uh, for for women. So um, there was a British, a, a UK team uh, that went to Singapore uh, for a tournament. And they actually, th I think they got second. So shout out to those guys. Uh, I, I know a couple of them. Ruby. I think uh, Bell is another name. Uh, part of the reason I know about this, to be perfectly honest, is because I was working with Sheep for Southeast Asia, and I think she was like the coach of mm -hmm. the team because uh, she didn't actually want to play, so she, instead she coached. Um, so yeah, shout out to them. Good, it, good work. It, Got it, second. It, Hell yeah. It, it was the it was the Singapore Women's uh, it, it, Singapore Global Esport Games. Uh, ran ran a Dota Women's League, and I believe that the the, the finals with Great Britain were out there and faced was actually Team Singapore, and Team Singapore won. Um, but like I know people um, like like Sparks who competed for the 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 Netherlands team. I know some people who were involved in in the American team. Like it was like really awesome to see that. So you know people are out there doing work. If if you want to support them, follow Dota Valkyries on Twitter. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, go check them out. So, yeah, that's pretty much the, the, the drama, the big drama that happened. If you somehow missed it, it went really, really viral. Like, every single esports scene was having that discussion. And most of them, I, I feel like because most of the esports scene does trend very left, which is, is funny. Just, just an, a, a weird thing. I've always thought about this. Like, the two Valve games, it's very interesting that, like, the talent for Dota being uh, uh, very liberal... And the talent for CSGO, the more conservative. And I always thought that was really interesting. Like, uh, like, what, what, what is, is that just like a genre difference? Is, is that like, do, do shooters, like, do Are you tactical saying, Cap, shooters just hold, lean more? <laughs> let me, let me take the words out of your mouth. Us Dota uh -huh. players got big brains. And our, and our yeah, big yeah. brains, our big brains have, have room not just for all those fucking mechanics to know, like, the Queen of Pain ulti AoE. We're also mm -hmm. thinking mm -hmm. about uh, empathy and fellow men. Where those CS players, small brains, they got small brains. They do the pew pew and they just, <laughs> they love, they love things like, I don't know, uh, uh, trickle down economics. Because that's how the money works in Counter Strike. My metaphor is falling apart, um, and I definitely mean 
all of what I just said. <laughs> that would be um, so funny, though. Know, <laughs> like, just for some reason, the CSGO economy works through trickle-down triple <laughs> economics. Just, like, one guy's getting all the kills, and, like, he spends money, and the money just, like, goes down the line to the people who have the least kills. Like, if you have the second most kills, you you get some of the money that was spent by the number one shooter, and, and, and so on and so forth. <laughs> That'd be so funny if that, well, if that was just the thing. Thorin never drops guns, because that is handouts and charity and we can't have any of that in our counter-strike economy like you have to bootstrap and earn your own m4 motherfucker um anywho (laughs) so yeah that was uh that was the drama that happened uh i i think most of it was just people just kind of clowning on each other but i do think there were some interesting perspectives if uh if you want to seek that out um I uh I, I retweeted uh the ones that I I found. There's something else I wanted to say about that, but I can't remember what it was. That's but, probably not important. Um support women. Yeah, probably. Uh t- 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 <laughs> um let's let's wrap out by by giving a shout out to uh to patreon.com slash side poll and doing a little yes. uh, and, and doing a little pee pee what. <laughs> Boy, they're having a great month so far. We started this whole thing. We took a break for one week. We're late on this episode. Hold, hold on, hold on. Okay, yes, we are late on this episode. Cap had to literally fly across an ocean, okay? Like, give, give, give us a fucking minute. Um, and second- I fell this asleep is, last night because I was jet lagged. This is this is the first episode where people are actually- char- Like, like the, the Patreon works where like the first of the month people get charged, right? So technically- Oh, no. Okay. Te- Technically, even though they signed up, no one paid for anything uh, except Yet. for three, day- three days ago. So first off, okay. thank you for everybody who was there. Second off, if you are on Patreon um, and and you want to ask a question, which we will answer on the show, uh, there is, there is a post up for January questions we're taking. Just comment there and we'll answer any question or hypothetical. Uh, and Cap, I sent you one in Discord, which is probably now scrolled back because we talked a lot over over the last uh i got it uh so 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 hit me with it okay hey guys so liquid is an actual esports all right they said esports with the dash the e dash sports i'm gonna They're... presume they didn't actually write that and that was that was uh corrected autocorrect uh so i'll, I'll forgive you for that uh esports or so Liquid is an actual esports org slash business. So I was wondering how much of the Liquid staff are talent or not. Specifically, I would be curious how many employees are talent slash pro gamers, uh, support staff directly rated to talent, content creators for Liquid, uh, and business p- business admin people, stuff like that. Uh, rough estimates are 100% fine. Uh, and then there's a follow-up question. So let's just start with that. Uh, this, what would you say? This feels like a question for me, someone who is literally wearing a Team Liquid wow. hoodie. If you're watching the video, all of my clothes are now Team Liquid. They give me too much. Um, uh, to answer that question, I'm thinking about it right now. Um, I think that Team Liquid has like maybe close to 250 employees, which includes all of our players and our athletes. Um, so much less when you, when you don't take this into account. I think... I think that there are two people on staff who were ex-pro players um, or content creators. Everybody else is are, are people who are, uh, by and large, experts in their field, which is kind of my advice for people who are, like, looking to, quote, get into esports, like... Do the thing that you want to be doing or you are good at and then apply it to esports instead of working backwards, right? Like like you can be you can work in esports as an accountant if you're like, you know, if if if, if you're if if you're if you're an accountant, if you're if you're a money person, you can still work in esports for a team or an org, but like you're being an account. You don't have to be a gamer, right? Like you can you can mm-hmm. mesh your interests. If you want to be a writer in esports, you should probably like, you know, do a bunch of non esports writing. Like learn to be a really good writer, then apply it there. If you want to like be in social media, same thing. If you want to, you know, be in content production and lighting and cameras, like same thing, right? Like get good at that skill, then see how you can apply it to the field. 
um, because it's not the other way around where most people are pro gamers or or competitive. I actually think, you know, as I say that, I'm kind of an outlier because I personally live somewhere in the middle. I used to compete at an amateur level, like never professionally. I might have won a couple, like, you know, Cal Eyes or whatever. Like, I play, play, play some Counter-Strike and stuff. It's fine. Um, I, you know, I, I, I might have gotten... Oh, no, it's another Suns fan. I might, I might have gotten like you know, uh, third place in a collegiate you think, Dota tournament. Do you think at your best? Hold up, this is important for the podcast. Do you think at your best at CS:GO that you were better than Source. Suns fan? I need to know this. Source. I, I, I when, when I was oh, playing, you were was, you were a Source player when I was playing. Uh, well, it was Source. Uh, as far as I understand, CS:GO CS players in general don't respect Source players, so. That's correct. So uh, I I don't know how good Suns fan is or was, but like uh-huh. I I did play a season of Cal I, and I got second place in 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 a Cal M, you know, league, which boosted me up to okay. Cal I. So like, but like I never played ESEA. I I I don't really know what it would be. I know that I'm a better Day of Defeat player than anybody else in Dota though. Wow. Yeah. Look at you. Why do you know that? Why because are you so no confident one, because about Because no, there's no way anyone else played that game, and if they did, I probably would know about them. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, See, you should have had that same confidence for beating Suns fan. <laughs> I, it would have been fun if I did, but like I, I'm, I'm ignorant to how good he was, and, and maybe if I, maybe if I knew a little bit more, I, I could, I could talk about it. But like, I, I was, I played a lot of, I played a lot of Counter Strike, played a lot of Counter Strike, played a lot of Day of Defeat, played like competitive Dota at a collegiate level, and like did pretty like. You know, never the best, but okay. Um, I think I was going to draft. I'm going to shut it down. I'm going to say you weren't as good. Suns fan holds himself to be a former professional CS player. So I would never call myself that. If you can't, if you don't have the balls to call yourself that, then you don't have the That's confidence. That's a lie, though. That's a you lie, though. You don't have though. the confidence to play the game. Anyway, uh, I, I do know. Uh, so there is uh, one person that I know who is like, the, I don't know exactly what he does at ESL, uh, at ESL. Like, I know he did. Like, when I see him, it's in the capacity of doing interviews and stuff. Um, but I know he works for ESL. I think he just does content creation and, like, general hosting across multiple games. Um, he is probably the one of, like, besides the people who, were, like, you know, like, started their own organization and stuff like that. He's uh, one of the people who I know is probably had the highest prestige, I guess. Um, and made a transition into um, a tournament organizer or just a regular esports business, which is uh, Ryan Hart. Mm-hmm. It's an FGC guy, um, so I don't know a ton about him as a player, but I know he was very, very good. Uh, and he works for ESL. So <laughs> there are some people who definitely make that transition. If um, I can but make... as Joey said, they usually, like, you want to have skills, so... If I can make an overgeneralization, this doesn't apply to everybody, but I think it applies to a lot of people. Players get to where they are because they're incredibly focused and do one thing, which is playing the game at a very high level and being involved in it. A lot of times that doesn't mean that you're developing a skill set that transitions into like a normal workplace where you're someone who is just, you know, again, d- doing a support role, like d- doing the accounting or the social media or, or the content creation. That's why when you see transitions, you often see them happen like on camera because like they can leverage personality or like their experience streaming. But like, you know, people go to school for years to, to you know, do marketing and you're not getting that same training necessarily if or at all if you're competing now joey let's uh, i'll speak for the viewer here uh what what if you were somebody who didn't have a, a tremendous number of skills uh maybe didn't go to college or dropped out of college um and and wants to be able to work in esports um, maybe in particular because they probably have no other prospects outside of esports. I'm talking about the viewer, of course, uh, and and trying to use their perspective. But for somebody who say like their game dies or something like that and doesn't have any other skills, and is, but only really has connections inside of esports, uh, where, where where where's my avenue? Uh, the common viewer, the common viewer who doesn't have the the skills. Uh, where's their avenue to get into esports? 
Um, I think if you're one of the very lucky few because you're super connected, there's probably consulting that can be done. Uh, oh, scamming people? Oh, hell yeah. Uh, but but other than that, I think that the most natural fit for someone who has been like potentially, you know, a, a super knowledgeable about stuff and needs like a somewhat general skill set is someone who is organized and can do project management. Because I think that that is a skill that is like seldom developed and people like maybe this viewer has a lot of uh, behind the scenes knowledge of like how things might work because they're like, I don't know, like, like, well, networked or something. I, I, I think that there is an important need for people who understand some of these like events and teams and ecosystem to do general project management, which is a role that I think a lot of people aren't great at. Um, so you're saying similar to the dota talent ecosystem that it's all about networking it's all about connections and networking that's what you're saying y you have to know someone and or blow someone like i mean come on how else do you get it it's, it's, it's hollywood baby um hold on Where, where's my chapstick i need to keep these <laughs> lips fresh uh, I, I i would say that i feel like the most common uh way for people uh to get into esports organizations and they have no skills um is adminning uh, no, no offense to the admins out there, uh, but it's like admitting is is usually something that it just takes time um, and a lot of volunteer hours. And people volunteer; they be, be they they are tournament admins or 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 they're like they volunteer and they are um, handlers, team handlers or talent managers and stuff like that. And they they you don't have any like education, like you don't have any background of some sort of education uh, that gives you like hard skills like accounting or something like that. Um, that that sort of thing is just generally like Joey said, like organization, hard work and, and stuff like that. That's kind of how you can get in the base level. But it's esports. A lot of people want to do it. So you're probably going to have to do some volunteering. If uh, like similar to what you're saying, like I think that there is a paramount. If if you're someone who can train yourself and other people to just be organized, which sounds like such a fucking basic skill, but it but it is so important. If if you're someone who can hone your organizational ability, then there's places for you. Or again, the chapstick that that works too, but not really. I don't think. Um, th you said my you said lips are so shiny. They, like like my face, I, I put on like face cream, and I can't get over how fucking shiny my face is this episode. Um, uh, th th you said you said there was a follow up to that question. We we we, we should not. Uh, yes, that. sorry. Uh, follow up. Follow up. Uh, if you were the CEO and had unlimited power, what additional staff positions would you hypothetically like to hire? Uh, would you favor talent over editors slash producers? I don't know, Joey. Would you? Hmm? I mean, uh, the, the perfect situation is a Goldilocks situation who can do both. That's a conceited answer. I can do both. Um <laughs> wow. Look at this guy pushing himself in front of the camera all the time. Um, calls himself Goldilocks. You, you, <laughs> like, like I, I, I think that that is, um, and I hope this is true. I, I think that's a lightly flawed question because the answer is you need both. And if you have to choose mm. one, I would make sure that you have a good support staff. Um, but that also depends on what your goals are because if the goals are, you know, uh, part of the reason why you know you see Hundred Thieves blow up as a company, uh, right, is because they have influence from big talent, right? So, you, so there is something incredibly important about having talent that draws people to you as as a team or an organization or a brand or what have you, right? You, yeah, it seems like they have the rule that they only hire talent <laughs> of some kind. You have to have big Twitter number to be followed to to be hired. But, Speaking but, of, uh, Grace got uh, Grace got um, hired recently at 100 Thieves. Congratulations to her. She'll never hear this, but congratulations. That's exciting. Um. But yeah, like, like, so, so you, you need both that that's, that's really the thing. Like you, like you need people who can be out there and are talent and probably like big talent to, to make a splash and do stuff. But you also need people who can support them. And oftentimes the, the, the person who can do both is more, um, of, 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 a, of a rarity than people who can do either one very well. Like yeah. me, I can do both at a medium high level, but neither one exceptional. 
And ideally, you yeah, well, want one person who can do each of those roles exceptionally. Yeah, when I was... Um... When I quit joined Dota, um, I interviewed, I talked to a couple different companies. BTS was one of them. Um, Twitch was one of them I tried to get a hold of. They actually never got back to me. Um, and ESL was another company um, that I talked to because um, I wasn't sure how well I would be able to support myself working only talent work. Um, so in a, in some ways, I wanted to see what my options were of working like a, a, a somewhat regular job while also being able to do talent work. Um, and ESL um, interviewed me to I would have worked under um, Chobra. If you guys know him from hosting TI six, eight, one of those. Um, he was he's a a host and uh, used to work for ESL. I'm not sure if he still does um, as a producer. And so I would have worked under him and learned his job. Um, but that that would take that. Obviously, that's where the connections come into play. Um, and ultimately, I didn't choose that because it, they would have required me to. I think they said by like I think we were to have this conversation. I think they said within like two years we'd need you to stop doing talent work. Which that was like what five years ago or something like that. So yeah, eh. uh, yeah. So I made the right decision for the immediate future. For a long term future, we'll see. But yeah, production. If you can get into it, I think is something that you can kind of learn on the job. Uh, a a lot of it is. Uh, would that be incorrect, Joey? Like live tournament production. You can learn on the job, but it takes a lot of time. And you have to have okay. people who are willing to let you learn, I think. Like, yeah. or, or you have to be such a go-getter that you, like, aren't being... Un... Th th there's people who try and learn on set and, like, are kind of annoying about it because they're, like, almost mm -hmm. too bright-eyed, but, like, other people have to do their jobs. Um, but if, if you are okay being someone who can kind of sponge up information, then I think learning on the job is, like, kind of the best-case scenario. But I don't think that that fits everyone's archetype. So so yeah. to, to say that it's case-by-case, case, which is always an annoying answer, is, is probably the most accurate. But yeah, don't get into esports, kids. It's not worth it. Just leave gaming as your hobby. Or if you do... Get a regular get... job, and then if you happen to see an opportunity to get into esports, and the pay is similar, which likely it's not, it's probably worse, but, you know, it, it, if you can actually get yourself into a, an esports job naturally, go for it. But I would say don't set up to, to do it. Yeah. Take, take your skill that you're good at and apply it to esports, not the other way around. Yeah, it's okay to have like a regular normie job. That is totally okay. Uh, you, you do you like making your hobby your job? There, there. It's not all butterflies and rainbows. Uh, it's it's okay to have a job that is just there to make money, and you can explore your passions and and hobbies outside of that job. You know, I haven't really thought about that, but that is definitely something that we have in common that I think is uh is so somewhat unique. That that we're two people who have jobs built from the hobbies and passions um mm -hmm. that now have to be like but we also we but we also worked a regular job as well like mm -hmm. we experienced what that was like and then got into our dream job scenario so yeah. I, I I actually uh, I don't I don't like the idea of dream jobs because I think that it misguides a lot of people that the idea that there is a dream job I think that most yeah, people find what they're really good at and then that evolves into their dream job like people go like like my own experience is like oh i'm really good at like you know this 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 con i fucking hate that i was gonna say content creation like i realized i was good at production and i ne my goal was never to be a producer i realized i was good at it i grew to love it and now i have what people would call a dream job but like it wasn't a goal i was seeking out it was something i found um I, I love the, uh, the there's the, the Japanese, have you seen this one? The Japanese concept of uh, what's called Ikigai? No. Uh, it, it, it is a Venn diagram with four different circles and, and Ikigai is the, the very center. It means a uh, reason for being and it's it's what you love, what you're good at, what you can be paid for and what the world needs. And being able to get all of those things in one uh together is is like the the dream job uh scenario but i think it, it gives a better uh, descriptor of like what what you're talking about i i agree in some degree that like 
uh, dr- dream jobs are, are mega overhyped. But uh, the I think people what people don't actually do, they don't break down what a dream job actually means. They just think it's a job that you would have fun doing. Yeah. But that, that that is not actually satisfaction. What is usually satisfaction it requires you to be able to do something you're good at. <clears throat> for most people, because most people actually want to be able to like feel like they're succeeding and not just getting paid money just to be paid money. Uh, but you do need money. Money is super important, so you need something to get paid for. Uh, it's something that helps the world in some degree, helps society in some some degree, is is uh, like that helps with fulfillment a lot. And something that um, if I was maybe a little bit more. Uh, broader focused i guess maybe i would have a, a problem with that in my current job but uh my, i i i'm i'm okay with just being able to make people laugh every once in a while i feel like that's that's an, that's I, that's enough i can bring to the world i don't need to do more than that uh and obviously i love my job so i have a a pretty nice pretty nice venn diagram going on there and but not I, everything needs to be that. Sometimes you just doing something that you're good at and gets you paid is is also works. I used to work a job that got me paid. And there was nothing else. There was no other advantages to it. Uh, I'm sure that we annoyed at least one person who went those fucking smug, lucky ass fucks with their bullshit perfect scenario. Um, you can't say that to us. We worked real people jobs. We worked real people jobs. All right. Unlike some other schmucks at esports who have never experienced that. All right. They've ever experienced that downtrodden, fucking mind-breaking daily labor that slowly chips away at your humanity. You become lifeless. We've experienced. That. I, the, I, uh, I'm happy that I did customer service stuff. I would be in a very bad place if I had to do it again. <laughs> very, very small note. I, uh, there was somebody who who uh, asked me recently why I took like a, a certain job. It was a Mobile Legends Bang Bang thing. They're like, why? Why do you do that? Like, why? Like, um, you for the you hoodies. don't actually like you don't actually enjoy. It's for the hoodies. Absolutely, they're the best hoodies. Yeah, like you don't enjoy that more than doing your regular Dota job. So like, why do you do stuff like that? And I thought about it, and this wasn't actually my my answer. Um, it was kind of my answer. I was like, well, it's my my immediate answer was like, well, it's a lot of money. <laughs> that was my immediate answer. But the what I thought about it, the reason that's important because I, I don't necessarily just need more money. The reason why I take a job like that is because when I broke it down in my head, I was like. When I do a job like that, I'm making 200 times the hourly rate that I used to make doing a job that I hated. Compared to a job that I don't love, but it is challenging and it's interesting to me and it falls within like a wheelhouse that uh, of like things that I do enjoy. So I was like, when you put it like that, it's like I'm going to take every single one of those that is possibly ever thrown my way. Because the comparison of like what I used to do and the opportunities that I have now are so dramatically different that I'm going to take every single one of those opportunities when given the chance. That's pretty fair. Something, something capitalism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, if you want to ask us a question that we can turn into a 30 Give minute- us money. That you Give can turn us this into a 30 minute tangent on the show. Um, <laughs> that, 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 that'll be patreon.com slash side poll. Um, and that is what we do at the end of the show now is we go, here's a question, here's the Patreon link, and get the fuck back to whatever you were doing. Turn the show off, or the app will turn it off for you, I think. Or just skip to the next episode or whatever you're listening to. <laughs>